we can look before everybody else to be on fire for God. Oh, they're in church every Sunday. They're they're solid believer. But God knows whether behind all the facade that there's actually real revival going on. Do you understand? Like I've seen people even come into church and they've got the words. And oh, the words are eloquent. The words sound right. But behind it, it's all, all fizz and bubble. To me, it's a very enlightening subject and very exciting. Um, so I kind of was looking at today again. I got a couple more thoughts in regard to revival. So what is revival? Um, I just wrote this down. I felt, again, I just felt there was something in there, maybe for somebody tonight. Um, what is revival? It's a fresh inflow of the life, love, and power of God. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? You know, that revivals, whenever you just... What you're getting, it becomes fresh. Okay? Have you ever got into a rut where everything seems stale? Anybody? Where your prayer life's stale, reading the words stale, fellowships stale. It's like, what's happening to me? Who's ever been there? Anyone? Okay. So, can you see in this definition, would you agree that this is contrary to that? So if you think of staleness, then I don't know about you. I don't like I don't like stale bread or stale food. You know, you can you can put it into the microwave or whatever, but it's still it's still stale. Okay. Well, a fresh inflow of the life, the love, and the power of God is really when you feel the Holy Spirit on you, starting to give you an excitement about the things of God. Okay, it is when a Christian gets real, okay? It's when they start to function the way they are meant or designed to function. It is when they get back to what they are meant to be. What are we meant to be when it comes to spiritual matters? Witnesses? Yep. Uh, uh, Randy. Light. Huh? The light. The light? Yep. We should be, a, wherever we go, we should be a shining light wherever we go. And it doesn't matter how dark. See, another thing today is a lot of Christians are complaining about the darkness. Oh, my workplace is dark. We'll shine. Uh, well, America's dark. We'll shine. Um, well, my family's dark. We'll shine. It's like, again, I, I know I, I quote it often and I'm, it's just I sat under him for so long, but Pastor McCollins says we, we have a choice. We either curse the darkness or switch on a light. Uh, uh, Christine. So then that would require obedience. Yep. <laughs> or answering them. Yep. See, what, one, let's, let's remember this, that anything good, wholesome, that, that we possess is a response to the, the movement of the Spirit of God in us. Okay. So a lot of time we're like, see whenever it's just you, like, okay, I'm going to make an effort here or whatever. When it's you, it normally doesn't last. But when the Spirit of God kind of just touches you, it's fresh, but it also empowers you to do what you can't do of yourself. So, for example, prayer. You know, prayer can be monotonous at times. It can be difficult. It can be dry, but it also can be quickened. And I'm telling you, sometimes, and this is what I do, sometimes I'll come into a prayer meeting and I feel like, oh, what's wrong with me? I don't even feel like praying. And sometimes by faith, by faith, I just open my mouth with the little that he's given me. And I just open my mouth, I start to glorify the Lord, and it just starts to flow. And I'm telling you, a lot of it, you have to fight through that apathy, that indifference. that, that It's like something trying to cling on to you. And you come on like, why am I like this? Like, why am I, why am I not even looking forward to receiving the word of God? And whatever? So I'm just telling you that there has to be a, a, a fight back. But that fight back really needs to be a touch from the Lord. But that doesn't mean that we're not working in partnership with him. So I'm telling you because he, he tells us to pray without ceasing. So we don't need to say, Lord, is it your will that I pray in this prayer meeting? And it's like, Hello? 
you understand? So I don't think what don't don't ever ask him, Lord, is it your will to read your word, the word? Is it your will to uh, witness? Is it your will to be in the house of God? Like he's not going to go against his word, would you agree? So, um, I want to say this here, and because uh, I was thinking about this today. There are different degrees of revival. Um, there can actually be a process in revival. I don't believe we just go from A to Z. And um, Miguel made a, a point. Um, he mentioned uh, sanctification. Um, sanctification is a process. But I'm telling you, when God's reviving you, it's not like you just go from 1 to 10 sometimes. Sometimes it's a journey. But you just know, you know what? I'm not where I was, but I'm not where I could be. So please know in revival, sometimes he starts to take you on a journey. And on that journey, you just start to realize, I'm, I'm growing here. I'm starting to get my cutting edge back. Um, I, I, I'm going in the right direction. So revival can be an instant thing. Literally, I've seen people come to the altar just the anointing of God come upon them, and you know what? They're never the same again. I mean, they, just something happens in the supernatural realm that is really, really hard to put into words. But, um, but so please, I just want you to know this, guys, that um, revival can be like an instant 180, where it's like something happened to me tonight, and I, I'll never be the same again. Like, I, I come in, and over this last few months, I've been this. And then you go out of that service, and you're like that. But it just can be a gradual building, brick upon brick. Uh, and then you look back 12 months, and you're like, wow. 12 months ago, I was there, but today I'm here. That's all revival. So does that make sense? Re revival can be a process, but it can be a supernatural touch. Like, tonight... The Holy Ghost could come into this meeting and could absolutely fill every one of us at the one time with the Holy Spirit. And we could just be so full of power, boldness, authority, whatever we need, desire just to surrender everything to Him. So let's not put God in a box on the subject of revival. Go ahead, Curtis. Could it, be, uh, could it be that one person may experience it and no one else? So maybe I... I'm the only one that gets revival today. Yes. You know, like, <laughs> yep. Something happens where you're speaking and it's like, dude, it hits me and my life's never the same, you know. But everybody else is like, oh, that was just normal Tuesday Bible study. Yep. You know. Well, it, it's funny you said that because I've talked over the years to many people who, and I've been in cars going home from church where I'm like, wow, wow. And the other person like, I didn't get anything. It's like, is your ears painted on? Like, hello? Like, there, how could you not get something tonight? There's something wrong with you. But I've heard that testimony of different people heading out of church. One is absolutely glowing. The other one's like just apathetic. So, go ahead, Lisa. Is that, though, considered revival? Or is it just you were touched that one time? Wouldn't revival be something that is like fire ongoing and not just like a one and kind of done so what we're going to do in a few minutes hopefully is go to the three different types of revival okay personal revival collective revival and then national revival so i don't want to run ahead of myself but that's a good question so if i don't answer it when we get there please re-ask that question um so um this, this was the kind of illustration I kind of wanted to use. A sick person may revive and get a little better and then later be restored to full health and strength. Okay? So I'm sure you've been in a hospital where somebody like, maybe the doctor gave them a pick-me-up or something. Okay? And they perked up and this phrase is they were revived. Like, they're not the way they were this morning. Okay? You know, they so they were kind of revived a bit. But that doesn't mean they've actually arrived at the place of full health and strength. So what I'm trying to say to you is I'm using that as an illustration of the use of the word revival. 
that there can be a, a touch, okay? There can be a touch where you're like, that revived me, but that doesn't mean that there's not major stages to come in your own personal experience. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm just trying to, because sometimes our perception is revival is an event. You know, someday there's going to be one meeting and that's it, we're all going to be different. But it could be a little bit more different than that. Go ahead, Cameron. What about that verse in, what about that verse in Proverbs? There is a time for everything under heaven. Absolutely. So the um, for Curtis, it may be right, right now, right tonight. Yep. Yep. For me, it may be five days or ten days from now. For you, it could be three days from now. Sure, it could be five hours from now. I have no idea. Yep. But it's true. Yeah. And the reason is because we're all so different. Right. And we're not only are we humanly personality so different, but also we're in different places in our journey. Like, you could come in tonight completely tired, burnt out. And it's just basically the fact that you're even here is a miracle. Because, you, you know, you could have actually wanted to just maybe put the feet up and just put the fire on or whatever you do to relax or whatever, <laughs> chillax or get on your cell phone. But, but I'm telling you, please know that the fact you're here tonight is a touch from God. Would you agree? It's actually a touch. A touch is even to be here, but you could actually come here like this happened to me whenever I was working shift work in the police. I was so tired at times. I, would, I, w I was there, but I was tired. But I'm telling you, as the word of God was preached, I was revived. My spiritual man was revived. I was like waking up, like literally, wow, this is great stuff. I need to get this down. So I'm just letting you know revival is a very broad thing. And we need... You know, we, try not to just put it in that box because we're dealing with the Holy Ghost here. Right. We're dealing with power. Okay, last week we covered two of the churches in the book of Revelation that were in a bit of a mess, um, that had backslidden badly, and the Lord obviously had things to say to them. And we didn't get to the third church, which was uh, the church of the Laodiceans. And uh, tonight I want to go there. Um, Ron, would you help us hear the church of the Laodiceans, Revelation 3, 15, 17. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Um, the old preacher said this. Do you remember the time where, was it Peter and James, or was it Peter and John, or someone went to the lame man outside the temple? And... Um, they said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, wise up, rise up and walk. And, you know, the preacher said this, No longer can we say in our day, Silver and gold have I none. But he says equally, it doesn't seem today that we can say in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Do you understand? We, we have all the material things today, a bit like the Church of the Laodiceans. And it's one thing that's interesting about the Church of the Laodiceans, it talks about the Church at Sardis, you know, the Church at Smyrna. But when it gets to the Laodiceans, it calls them the Church of the Laodiceans. And the word Laodicea actually means laity. It was basically, it, wasn't, it was a church run by the people. It's called the Church of the Laodiceans. It was their church. But the Lord wasn't really able to do much there. So, would you agree, this is a pretty grim thing that Jesus has sent to the, this church. Huh? I mean, would you agree they're in a bad state? Um, look how he summed it up. You're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesse, what do you think he's getting at there? Uh, there's people, people who look, they... 
they look good on the outside. You know, they may have the possessions and they may have the nice house, nice car, good looking wife, whatever, you know, but at the end of the day, like he's saying there, you know, they're actually, they're wretched, they're miserable, they're poor, mm -hmm. uh, just because they're rich in possessions, they're poor in, <clears throat> in the qualities of Christ, you know, and, uh, they're blind to his truths, you know, and that, yeah. It's not a sad indictment that says that you're, okay, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Uh, are we naked? Are, are God's people naked? No. Okay. So, uh, Cameron, have you thought? Uh, what really stuck out to me about that it was I'm like, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Um, no, Who's that preacher in Texas? Yeah, Joel Osteen. He, that, he, Little Day Sin Church, Joel Sin Church, the big, big mega church. I guarantee you, there are multiple people, if not a majority of, the, of those people in there have mansions, have great big houses, mm. have boats, have the nicest cars on the lot, mm. and they're miserable. Mm -hmm. They're pa they're poor. They're naked. They're blind. And you know, there's big churches. I have no doubt there's big churches, and they're like that. But there's little churches and like that all around us here. Exactly. S seriously, pick any like Midwest town and go to them. A lot of them, if you look in their driveway, they, they do have their boat there. They have their two f cars. They've got their three dogs and one cat, and they, they've got their three, four-bedroom house, but it, I, that can happen anywhere. I, I do believe it can happen in a mega church, mm -hmm. but it can happen in a, a, a small small church in a small Midwest town. Yeah. It, 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 to me, this year, I believe these seven churches are pictures of seven different churches that we could probably find in every state in America. I wasn't saying that there was multiple other. There wasn't multiple others. It's just Joel Osteen's church just popped into my mind. And you know, the only reason I, I I don't okay, I don't tend to name churches per se. Is number one, I've never been there, so I don't know. I, like I, I can I can judge what I know of his preaching. Okay. Okay. And, and I can kind of I can put all the dots together and kind of kind of speculate what type of person is attracted to that you know but i'm just saying I, i'm always careful if i haven't been to a church of of uh, does that make sense i'm i'm, I'm just kind of just saying i'm always careful at naming a church especially as a pastor because once i name it i could literally go out into the internet world and people could say oh pastor paul said but if i've been somewhere or i hear a preacher say something that is wrong, I can say categorically that is wrong. And I can assure you something, Joel Osteen's books are nonsense. Okay? And that's me putting it diplomatically. Christine. That's okay. I'll Spiritually bankrupt, that's what comes to mind. Yes. One, two, one, two. Lisa. The sad part about that scripture is they don't know. They don't know that that's their condition. That's the sad part. Amen. So, so I, I'm sure you would see the language. Every time I read this in the Bible, I don't know about you, but I kind of cringe at the fact, he says, they're neither hot nor cold. And it's that statement that he's going to spew them out of his mouth. That's a terrible thing that God would spew a church congregation. Now, one thing I want you to remember here, in all seven churches, he is speaking to the whole church. Okay? Um, sometimes people look at something like this and then they individualize it, which is what we do. But I'm telling you, he's talking to the whole congregation and saying, if you as a church do not waken up because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out as a church. So 
Um, I'm just saying that, that he's talking to the congregation. And it's important to remember that. So what has Jesus to say? What's the medicine here? Because um, there has to be an answer for this church. And here's the good news. It doesn't matter how messed up the church is, including Joel Osteen's church. There's always hope. Well, what I would say to you tonight, and this is a real question, who believes there's still hope for Joel Osteen's church? Who believes there's no hope for them? We don't have that authority. Only God can say there's no hope. So what I'm saying is that's why, I, if you notice as a preacher that I'm not one to get up here and try and get into just name calling because I see people doing that. And before you know it, it just becomes like a cancer. And people start then turning on each other. And well, they're not as good as I am and whatever. I, I'm just telling you for me as a pastor, I try to generalize and let the Holy Ghost say what the Holy Ghost wants to say. So would you say like all these churches are in a backslidden state then? Well, the, the three that we looked at were definitely in a messed up way. Yes, go ahead, Sherry. So it says, I know thy works. Mm -hmm. And thy works are lukewarm. Yes. Practically, what does that look like for a church to have lukewarm? I mean, I think I'd get cold or I'd get hot, but I don't know what lukewarm works would look like. Okay, so when it's talking about works, it's talking about activity. Okay? So remember this, that our actions are a result of our heart. Our words are a result of our heart. So... When it comes to our words, I believe we're judged on our words and our actions. But the number one thing we're judged on is our heart and our mind. So, like, th this is where we have to be so careful because we can't read each other's mind or heart. And, um, but what, what the Lord's doing is He's looking at this church, the activity in this church, and they're, they're just going through the motions. They literally have got themselves into a rut where it's not it's not anointed by God, it's not quickened by God, it's just there's just no fruit from their, their labors. So you know, we definitely know that we are called as Christians to labor for the Lord. Would you agree? Yeah. So when the Bible talks about obedience, I believe it can be talking about our words, but it also can be talking about our actions. So our actions tend to be a response to a revelation of God. So God shows us something and we, we use the phrase putting feet to our faith. So basically this, that God speaks and says as a church, I want you as a church to be doing this. We step out in obedience to what the Lord uh, wants and God blesses that. So it, I think this church, whatever they were doing, they were their activity was tepid. I don't think they were a very active church. Um, Ron and then Cameron. Yeah, I was thinking about that lately, and it's like we say we love the Lord, mm -hmm. but I've got this I got to do first before I get into the Word mm -hmm. or into prayer. I've got something else going on and he'll understand if I don't pray or if I don't read the word we always put him on the back burner mm -hmm. he's just not really there so we're kind of warm mm -hmm. we're thinking of him yeah and we're knowing we're wanting to do it yeah but we're not doing it yeah and uh but we think we're okay mm -hmm. but so it's we're not really cold mm -hmm. We haven't turned them off completely, but we just haven't got close to them either. Yep. I think that you, you're you hitting a nail on the head there that a lot of times we can, we can look before everybody else to be on fire for God. Oh, they're in church every Sunday. They're, they're a solid believer. But God knows whether behind all the facade that there's actually real... Revival going on. Do you understand? I'll go even further. We can, like I've seen people even come into church and they've got the words. And oh, the words are eloquent. The words sound right. 
But behind it, it's all all fizz and bubble. It's really it, you know. But you know, we're talking about a God who sees behind behind all this what we we see, and He really is looking right into the heart of things to see is He number one. Like with the church at Ephesus, they'd lost their first love. So something else was in the place of the Lord. Uh, on this subject here, there's no doubt that they're. That I don't even think they were active. I think they were asleep. Go ahead, uh, Christine. Well, you could be everyone just. Or you could be being busy, like being under Satan's yoke, mm -hmm. and you're just doing the routine, the checkbox, the things you're supposed to do. Could that possibly be like the works too? And you're not just going, God, what do you want to do here? Like, is that possible? Okay. Okay. So, okay, we'll go to Steve after you, but here, here, let me just respond to that. My gut feeling is that this wasn't a legal, legalistic church. This was a church. They were just dead, you know. <coughs> their their churches. Um. I mean, I. I'm trying to think of the other, you know, the other seven churches that. Um. I I know what you mean. That there's churches that can be active out of bondage. And they can be busy, 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 and they look apart. But it, it's not what the Lord wants because they're they're trying to do it to make to look good before man. They're not doing it because God wants them to do it. So here, here's here's the way we need to look at it. Whether it's that extreme or that extreme. So busy, busy people that are doing it just as a show, or people that just won't do anything for the Lord. It's all the same. It it, it produce, the Lord's just shaking his head at both and going garbage it, that's all it is would you agree that if you're doing things to impress people and please man it, what is it i think one knows i mean one is getting things somewhat done but it, i mean because if you're not doing anything it's not producing any good spiritual fruit but at least maybe the other side is actually doing something <laughs> Like yeah. in the natural, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so then we have to ask, this is good to have a conversation. Is there another alternative to this and this? Okay. So you'll find with all truth, there's a balance. Okay. So there's people can be so busy, they don't have time for intimacy. Ron, we, you're talking about intimacy. Like Martha was like that. Martha was go, 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 go. Like a headless chicken. And yet the Bible says she was cumbered with much care. She was weighed down. She was just weighed down and she was going north, south, east and west at the one time. She may have looked impressive, but she wasn't getting it. I believe Mary was right in here in the middle where she she wasn't like going 90 mile an hour, but she wasn't wasting her time. She was in the presence of God. What was she doing? Is that wasted time? Is that lukewarmness? Is that apathy? Sitting in the presence of the Lord, just loving on Him, listening to Him. Is that wasted time? So I'm telling you that that extreme is not like deadness and just nothingness. That extreme is wrong. So I, don't, I think we need to realize there is a balance in this thing. That this bit in the middle is doing what God wants you to do. And feeling at peace whenever He wants you to take time out and do nothing. And I do believe there's times where he just wants you to be set apart, just you and him time. I know that if, on a Friday night, whenever I came back to the Lord, Friday night to me, when all my friends were going here, 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 and here, the Lord said, I want time with you on a Friday night. And I would sit in my bedroom on a Friday night, just reading the word, meditating on the word, and being burdened for other people. So I'm telling you that you have to know that there is a time to take time out and rest. There's time to set yourself apart. Where you, you come out of the crowd where Jesus set himself apart so that he could get away from all the noise, all the activity. Where he, he, It was just alone time. And by the way, the alone time was him, him and his father. So I still believe that that's activity. That is not apathy. That is not laziness. We know that. So I'm just telling you, in here is Holy Ghost driven. Would you agree with that? That there, there's there's times you can just like sometimes he just wants you to take time out with your family, enjoy your family, and he's okay with that. You know, 
I mean, does he want us just going about with a permanent smile on our face? You think that's it? What happens if you if you go about in life with a permanent smile on your face? What happens? <laughs> your cheeks start to hurt. The other thing is the guy with the white coats might be coming to talk to you. No, but I'm telling you, nobody. I, there's times in life is is hard. There's times we're sad. Would you agree? There's times we're sorrowful. By the way, Jesus was sorrowful. So I'm telling you, all this year having to put on a fake smile, I've seen it out there. I don't know about you. Have you ever been around Christians that are putting on a fake smile and how you doing? Oh, wonderful. How are you doing? Underneath, they're not being real because their heart's heavy. They've maybe, they, they're struggling. They're in a battle. And that's why I'm saying I would rather just be in here. I believe in here in the middle where Mary was is real. And I'm going to back it up in a minute in the answer here. So uh, go ahead, Ron. I was just going to say, they're actually lying to God. Mm -hmm. They're trying to lie to, to the people around them, but they're really lying to God because they're trying to say, well, I'm okay. And God's saying, no, you're not. Exactly. Curtis. So uh, I have two, two points. So I think when I, I'm always, I've always been a little confused at Revelation, uh, this part here, because uh, the, the first part, I'd rather you be, what, either hot or cold. So that always like made me think, because I've heard a couple different perspectives on that. Like, you know, to be, to be like hot, like a, like a coffee, it's fresh, it's good. Mm -hmm. Or to be cold, like, you know, an ice cold cup of water, you know, it's yeah. really refreshing and it's great. So I've heard that perspective, but also cold being, you know, they're cold to towards the Lord or hot being they're hot on fire for God. But the description that we get here to me it, to me, it, I, I struggle with this because to me, it doesn't describe what a Christian is, right? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Mm -hmm. uh, we're clothed, we see, we're not miserable, we're rich in Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I know he is talking to a church, but yeah, I just feel like, um, and it has to be a, a true born again church. There has to be people who are born again mm -hmm. in there, but there are churches today that they they say they're churches, but they're not. You know yeah. what I mean? They're not they're not Christian by any means, but yet um, they would call themselves Christian. And then my other point was, so I I always do struggle with the Mary Martha thing because I do think Mary was being lazy, mm -hmm. that she was being a lazy bum, and mm -hmm. uh, like Mary, you need Marys to get things done. Mm -hmm. uh, Martha, you mean? Like yeah, Martha. Sorry, you need Marthas to get things done. Like it'd be great just to sit down at. Pastor Paul's feet all day and listen to him preach and all that, but <laughs> no. you got to have men like Kyle to get the speaker set up and everything going. And uh, so I don't, you know, I don't know. I I, I do think uh, that I do struggle with that Mary, Mary and Martha. Um, oh, but I, but I do think I need to. Uh, yeah, you got to take you got to take time to enjoy Christ and spend time with Him. Of course, yeah. you know. Um, Steve, sorry, I I forgot, Steve. I have not been ignoring you, Steve. His hands been up for a while. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing that I, that I see with the Laodicean in church and their lukewarmness is also too. They said, "I am rich," yeah, and they put more they put more uh, faith in their the belongings with the thing, and they got comfortable. They didn't they didn't need God, you know, and yeah. we need to strive for God every day, no matter where we sit. And I've even been there too when I had, you know, lots of money and, and everything. I did get I even got very complacent with mm -hmm. God because I really didn't mm -hmm. need Him. I mean, everything was going well. Mm -hmm. You know, God also does, you know, test us on many, many occasions and for many different things to get us in line with the Word again, to get us on fire again, and get us off our butt and get us on our knees mm -hmm. so that way we can keep moving forward. You know, that's the one thing I really see the problem with other churches with this same issue. I'm not going to name any churches, mm -hmm. but they're rich and increase with goods. You mm -hmm. know, they don't need anything, you mm -hmm. know, in the in the natural. They don't the need yesterday. to evangelize even because they've got they've got their church full. Exactly. That Michael Bryan. I got a comment on Curtis. Mary had chosen the good part and it will not be taken from her. That was what I was just gonna share. We we actually we, we don't actually need to speculate whether Mary was right or wrong. Once Jesus says she's right, then she was in the right place. So Mary was in the right place, even though she wasn't running at 90 mile an hour. That didn't mean, I don't believe that's the way Mary was every day. Just in that moment, she was in the right place with the Lord. Lisa, and then we'll go to Christine. I was just going to say anything you 
um, want to do for the Lord, there's going to be a fight. It's it's just like um, we started the, um, me and the twins started the um, family worship. It's a fight to do that every day. It is. It, something pulls you away or, you know, I, set, I even have to set an alarm because I'll just forget about doing it. Mm-hmm. So it's a fight. You have to get your mind set and you have to fight for that time with mm-hmm. the Lord and with your family. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Uh, Christine? Our flesh doesn't know how to sit at Jesus' feet. Yeah. And it's his spirit that brings the feet. Our flesh will will want to like strive and get tons of things done because things need to get done. We don't know how to not do that and and just get the, the Lord fill us up. Um, or our flesh will like just do nothing and whatever. But um, yeah, it's the spirit of God that was leading uh, Mary at God's feet. Honestly, guys, please hear me on this. I think this is something I'm talking about. This church is full of genuine people tonight i think we get the part of being active okay i'm not saying we're always there but i think we get the part of it being active you know reading our bibles being a witness one of the things i think we fall short on as the american church in the day that we're living in with all the distractions is time out just time out switch the cell phone off just get away alone just you and him can anybody else relate to that? That we, you know, so I, I honestly think there's something in there for us where the Lord is saying, in that moment, Mary was getting it. She had alone time with me and she chose the good part. It wasn't a time for running about going 90 mile an hour. So I'm just saying, how do we know then? Like every other issue, we know by the promptings of the Spirit of God. There's a time where the Holy Ghost will just say, listen, you need alone time with the Lord. There's other times where he says, it's time for you to go out and knock on doors. It's time for you to read, do a bit of studying on a particular subject. Busy, 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 but you're busy in the right way. So I I honestly think none of us today could actually say to each of us, we're all in different places to say, hey, this is it, A to Z. I think all we can say is, Lord, help me, show me. Sherry, did we answer your question, by the way? Yeah. You know, it, 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 I mean, guys, it's better to go through this slowly because there's there's nuggets written throughout this. So what did the Lord say to this church? What was his answer for this church? What was his medicine? Okay, Ron, can you help us here? And it's a strange, strange <laughs> medicine he's given them. The Church of the Laodiceans. Revelation 3.18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eye salve, salve, that thou mayest see. 319, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore and repent. 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Okay, guys, there's a bit of meat in here and we're going to have to ask some serious questions. Number one, was the gold here actual physical gold? Was the white raiment actual clothing? Was the eye salve actual ointment put on the eyes that were going? Okay. Does buying gold, which has been expressly tried in the fire on the commodities market, make us spiritually rich? Does specifically purchasing white raiment from our local store improve our standing before God? By the way, that's why the Mormons, a lot of people wear white. And they have ceremonies that they, they wear white. Because they think, they think that that's making them pure before God. Does putting eye salve in our physical eyes make us better Christians and an eliminate the lukewarm affliction that believers suffer from? Okay. I put it to you, this is all symbolism. But symbolism 
About what? Um, before we answer that question, I want to say something. Remember what the affliction was? They were naked, they were blind, and they were poor. Would you agree? So that was part of their problem here. So if you look at the three things here at the, in the first verse that he's talking about in verse 18, one's talking, if you're poor, gold would be really handy, wouldn't it? If you're naked, um, a white garment or any garment would be handy, wouldn't it? Um, if you're blind, um, maybe this eye salve would kind of help your sight. Okay? So I put it to you that this, there's a symbolism in here that we need to really look at. Um, of course, we get verse 19 about be zealous and repent. Okay? So we also get... Um, I'm sure I'm sure we can understand that. So I want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so this is what John Stott says. Ron, would you read this? John Stott, by the way, is a real... He's a writer, very like R.C. He reminds me of R.C. Sproul a lot, the way he writes, but very solid writer. John Stott says, They are poor, but Christ has gold. They are naked, but Christ has clothes. They are blind, but Christ oh, has it. Salve. Yeah. Let them come to him. He can register poverty, close their nakedness, and heal their blindness. I want to look at this gold. Um, what does gold represent? Yes, figuratively, what do you think gold represents? If it is symbolic, okay? So I put it to you that the gold, the eye salve, the white gar garments are not literal but figurative. So Curtis said purity. Why, why do we think of purity when we think of gold? Okay, goes through a refining process. Uh, Lisa? So to put your eyes on are things that don't burn up. So the, put your, um, acquire those things of the Lord because they don't burn up. Those are the riches, the riches of the Lord, and they don't burn up. That's really good. Anybody else? So, to me, gold represents the real, the genuine, the true. Gold represents everything that's right. Gold represents that which is just and holy. If you look throughout Scripture, you'll find brass and gold compared. And I'll give you an example. Any of you remember whenever the king of Shishak came to Israel and it, in the temple they had lovely gold shields around the whole temple. It was impressive to the eye. Okay, the king of Shishak um, stole all those gold shields. What did the Israeli king do to mitigate the whole thing? Hey, we're running low on funds. we got to make something work. Let's get some brass. <laughs> okay, so they put up brass shields. Now, to the human eye, when you come into that temple, would you probably notice any ginormous big difference between brass and gold whenever you come in and you looked r right around the temple? You think there was a real... It, it really looked particularly different. It didn't. But what's the difference between brass and gold? Brass is man-made. Brass is man-made. Gold is God-made. Gold is a pure metal. Now... I'm telling you, there's a lesson in there for us that when we try and mix what's real and what's not real, it's not satisfactory to the Lord. That was not what the Lord had designed for the temple. If he wants gold shields, then he deserves gold shields. So I put it to you, gold represents that which is created by God. Okay, so I, I want you to think about that whenever if you're in p spiritual poverty tonight, you need that which is created by God, belongs to God, that's authentic. Kyle, do you, have you any thoughts on this? Whether yeah, I mean, gold is wealth too, but I think he's talking about a particular kind of gold. He says a gold tried in the fire. So what's that say that's going to happen to you or that he's asking you to look for? A pure gold or to be burned away of things that don't belong. Mm -hmm. um, things that are going to keep you from having the true wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, a fiery, 
tried gold. Jesus this says, you know, treasure up yourself for things that are in heaven. Peter says, uh, don't be... Uh, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened unto you. Mm-hmm. Um, th- them are good things. You yeah. know, we, we don't look at them as good. We don't want to be in a trial. We don't want to have dross mm-hmm. burned away. But good gold, pure go- gold, doesn't have its point nine 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 percent gold, not mm-hmm. you know point nine five. Yeah. You know, so I mean, you're going to be in, uh, especially if you're lukewarm, you're going to have some things. Burned away that he's saying, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. So um could could be a little pain involved, right? Yeah. A little bit. Are, are, are you gathering tonight that we're trying to understand we know it's not literal. So we know that literal gold is not going to sort out their spiritual poverty. So we have to find out well, what is it? And it, there's definitely a symbolism here. But I think what we're talking about tonight, we're 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 not that far away. We're put, we're right in the ballpark here when we're thinking of. Uh, to me, that gold is is what that which is of God, what He gives us. It has to do something to do with that, something real, something authentic, something that's spiritually going to impact us. And if gold is from God, then give me what's of God. I don't want to have a brass shield. I want a gold shield. Um, because that brass shield will be a bit of me and a bit of him. It just it's it doesn't work. Um, okay, so what's his answer for nakedness? A white garment. Why a white garment? AJ, any thoughts? Why why a white garment? Why not a pink garment? <laughs> yep. I. I think one thing we need to realize when when the Lord uses illustrations, everything has a meaning. I think sometimes we read this and say, "Well, it's just a generalization." There's meaning behind everything that He says. So, the fact that it's a white garment represents purity. What else? Clean, huh? Spotless, righteousness. That again, that's all in the ballpark. Because the garments that we should wear should be pure. They should be righteous. They should be clean. They should be holy. So I, I think the you know, I, I think we're in the ballpark saying that it it's he, he's not closing us with real clothes here. He's clothing us with spiritual qualities. Um Christine. Um, when Jesus was a baby in the a baby in the main, or no, I don't know where he was actually. When he was a baby, they, the wise men brought him gold, uh-huh. right, because of his kingship. Yes, and so that gold, it's from its kingdom, like it's from God's kingdom. It's from Him, so it's it's mightier. It's not manly, like you were saying, like yeah. it's not man made. It's greater. It's perfect. It's kingdom, and then. The righteousness is his righteousness. Correct. And so it gets pointing up to him and that he's, he, we need what he has for us, what he's provided for us, mm-hmm. not our, our own stuff that's leaving us in a ditch. Absolutely. So yeah. Guys, you see where we're going tonight? We're, we're definitely in that, that area where I have no doubt that maybe this early church fully got it. Ron, have you thought? Uh, it's pretty well said, but I would just. I was just thinking on that. Anything we try to get is going to fall through. These are all things. Get them from me. Yes. Get them from me. Get them from me. In other words, we can't do it on our own. We have to ask him and have him give it to us. That's good. Guys, I hope when we have these conversations you take notes because what happens is the Holy Spirit's moving tonight. And because the Holy Spirit knows we want to know truth. Amen? And we mightn't be able to put it perfectly word for word, but I'm telling you that we're talking about the provision of God here. Cameron. Um, going to the elders here in church, um, um, I know that works and I know I need a whole cold no hot he says he says that and but then he says in verse nineteen as many as I love 
I rebuke, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. As many as I love. Now, would that be? I would assume that'd be the agape love, not yep. phileo. Yep, absolutely. Okay, well, if it's agape love, then I mean, then he's speak. He's not speaking to the whole congregation because not everybody is saved. Only, only his elect is saved. So, I mean, I assume his his elect people they're in that congregation and they're under that ministry he is telling them to be zealous and repent and open their eyes but then i guess that goes back to that verse in proverbs there is a there is a time and a place for everything under heaven amen so so let me just piggyback on that um okay when the Lord's speaking to a congregation, okay? This is what he says. He, he talks about sheep. He says, my sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. And a stranger they will not follow. Okay? He, he talks quite a lot about my sheep hear my voice. Or my sheep know me. Or are known of me. I, I know them, they know me. So... When he's speaking here, he's speaking to a congregation. He knows there's probably some will hear, some will not hear. So always remember what his messages are to a congregation. When the preacher gets up, he's preaching knowing that unless the Holy Ghost applies that to a heart, it's not going anywhere. So do you understand? So you can, you can share. People say, oh, you shouldn't talk about assurance among God's people because you might give false assurance. But they don't get the fact that his sheep will hear his voice. The bogus, the phony will, they're, they're phony anyway. They're deceiving themselves. But I'm telling you as a preacher, I, like, I talked to a preacher who said to me, I don't preach about grace anymore because there's too much greasy grace. That's what he said. He hadn't preached on grace for a couple of years. And I'm like, you're wrong. I, I remember like us having a disagreement. I says, you're wrong. I says, we should always as preachers preach about the grace of God. I says, because we are what we are by the grace of God. And even if there's somebody comes in who uses the grace of God for lasciviousness or loose living, that's beyond us. That's their issue. But that doesn't hold us back from preaching the truth. I'm telling you, his sheep hear his voice. That's all we need to know. Uh, Sherry. So with I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, and with what Kyle shared, which I agree so much with that, I think of Elizabeth Elliot, mm -hmm. who, who lost so much, mm -hmm. but gained so much more. Mm -hmm. And, I, okay, so here's, so here's my question. I know we're not supposed to pray, Lord, humble me. Mm -hmm. That would not be good. Mm -hmm. But so often I find myself, Lord, I don't like where we're, where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Would you? And then I stop mm -hmm. because I, do, I, I want to be different. I want the more, but I'm not sure I want to go through the fire. Can I help you finish that? Because, yes, but, but, please. The reason, the reason is because I actually prayed it yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Lord, will you help me to humble myself? Okay. Guys, there's a b b big difference. I, I've heard people say, Lord, humble me. And I'm like, I'm not amen that. And seriously, because if you ask God to humble you, he could take everything off you, literally. And I've seen people who, who laughed at me when I said that. And you know what? The prayers they were praying 20 years ago, they're still praying them. Seriously, because God has humbled them. They wanted to be married and they're still single 20 years later. And I'm like, I remember you being stubborn and saying, oh, I, I'm okay with that. But I'm telling you that you can pray for the Lord to humble you, but you better get your seatbelt on a, a, for the ride because it's going to be difficult. But isn't that, I mean, wouldn't that be ultimate though? You know what I mean? But uh, all, what I'm saying is ultimately for God, it's good, you know, fine. But for the human being, having to go through it, it, it what he would prefer you to do is humble yourself. You know, we, we have a choice, would you agree? We can humble ourselves. Would you agree we have that capability? 
Humble yourself in the presence of God. Humble yourself. If he has to humble you because you're so stubborn, I'm telling you, that is not good. Because I'm telling you, you it is not going to be a nice experience for you because he'll, he could literally strip you of everything you can. And you could be praying for some for years and it's not you're not getting the answer because he said, oh, I'm humbling you. Tell me about it. Huh? But, but humbling isn't the same as being tried in the fire. Correct. So when, when I pray, Lord, I don't like where I'm at, I'm not asking him to humble me. I'm asking him to change me. But I don't want to go through the experience of being changed. Okay. So does, you, that, does that make sense? Or am I, it, am I asking it the does, same but, thing? But we, by the way, these are good questions because we're in deep waters. By, and can I qualify because I, I, I agreed with you? Humbling you can be part of going through the fire. You, they, they, we're, we're dealing with deep, deep things here. So we have to be careful what we say yeah and nay to. Because basically going through the fire can be whatever God wants it to be. So you know, it's hard to put all of this in the little box. Because, Go ahead, Kyle. I shared this last week with Jesse and Curtis. I'm going to share it uh, tonight. Um, he says, it, you know, we, we talk about monergistic and synergistic, you know, before birth, before the Lord does something, it's the Lord doing it. But after, I believe that the Bible's clear that we, we work with the Lord. We're not robots. He mm -hmm. says, I counsel thee. Okay? Uh -huh. How many times have we told somebody, Paul's told somebody, I, I would counsel you to do this, uh -huh. you know? Does that person have to listen? No. You know? Um, but, but we know right and wrong. And if we're born again, we know right and wrong. And we know if we're, we're doing something that we shouldn't or doing, if we're lacking or whatever. I was telling them, there's this guy that uh, they have these commercials now, these cigarette commercials. He's, he's on oxygen. And he said, you know, I started smoking when I was in my teens or whatever. And he said, I knew I shouldn't have. And he said, I told my friends and we, you know, 20, 30 years into it, uh, he, they'd walk out to the car and he'd lie and he'd say, I have to go back and get something because I couldn't keep up with them walking. You know, but he kept on smoking. And he goes, I regret telling them a lie. But he goes, the thing I regret the most is telling myself that lie. Mm -hmm. And now he can't even walk from the kitchen table to the couch and he's out of breath because mm -hmm. he told himself that lie. Mm -hmm. So we're responsible. Absolutely. We, we know what to do. Exactly. And we, and we just cry out to the Lord for help. Who knows what that will be like, mm -hmm. you know? But we know that the further we get away... Mm -hmm. You know, we could end up with an oxygen bottle yeah. and not be able to walk across the room. Mm -hmm. You know, because we were what the Bible says, uh, unrepentance. Mm -hmm. We were, uh, uh, you know, nasty to the Lord. We didn't want to listen to him. And he's our father. And so we, we reap what we sow. You know, but if we keep that up on a daily, as you would put it, take a short accounts, mm -hmm. you know, um, daily, then it isn't it's quite as bad. You know, I'm not saying that it won't be as bad. You may be like Stephen, you know, and and go get stoned, mm -hmm. you know, but the Lord standing on the right hand, you know, standing, the Bible says, looking upon him. So we know that we depend upon him, that when we're in that tribulation, that he will uh, bring it, bring us through it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to have tribulation. We're going to have fiery trials, but it, it does depend a little bit upon us and how painful it can be, depending on how our obedience or disobedience mm -hmm. is with the Lord. If he counsels us to do something, mm -hmm. then maybe we should listen about it, right? And here's a thought, guys, because I know times kind of beat us, but just as Kyle was talking there, there's, there's quite a number of times it talks about the gold or the silver uh, taking away the dross so that the gold would come forth or the silver would come forth. This is related to it. When what what is dross normally symbolic of in scripture? Very consistently, huh? Sin and self. Okay. So whenever God's trying to burn off the dross, what's He trying to do? He's trying to purify us. Now, what's left then? If 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 self and sin is gone, and there's just gold left, what's left, Christine? In in our symbolism here, guys. But what is that gold? It's him. Okay? Do you understand? So it fits in with what we're talking about, that basically, if we're just left with gold, we're left with him. Go ahead, Ron. I think sometimes we get the concept that God is so cruel and so unconcerned and uncaring about us. He is our father. Mm -hmm. He's a loving father. And I would ask 
any of you who are parents, would you be that cruel as to just destroy your child because they asked for something that maybe they didn't understand the totalness of it? Mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe that our God knows what we really want in our heart. Mm -hmm. And I strongly believe that he's loving and caring and he doesn't want to hurt us any more than what is necessary mm -hmm. than to create that purity that he wants and sees in you. He will not take you through it unless he knows you can make it. Yes. He's not out to destroy you. You're not out to destroy your children. Correct. I agree. Absolutely. Just one thought on the, the white linen or the, the white garments. And we'll not turn to it tonight. Revelation 19, 7 to 9. It shows the church. They're red and fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The righteousness of the saints. Okay? So it is, it's who we are. It's who God's people are. Finally, and we'll do this real ultra quick. I salve. Anybody, any thoughts on the I salve? I mean, the problem is blindness, okay? Spiritual blindness. They're not seeing. Jesus many times says, you've got eyes to see, but you don't see. You have ears to hear, and you don't hear. So th this is his answer for the blindness. I salve. What do you think it might be symbolic of? The aha moment. The aha moment? Anybody else? What's the word that you use? Um, you can't just have a, a revelation. Oh, you have to be enlightened. enlightened. Okay. The difference between a revelation and enlightenment is the revelation is the truth. Okay? So you can hear the truth, but you mightn't be enlightened to that truth. Would you agree? You can hear the truth, and it's like, yep, I know that's true. I believe in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Yeah, I always go to church every Easter. I'm faithfully there. Once a year, I'm on the front row. Are they enlightened? Are they really enlightened? Okay, so I, I think really what Cameron said, what Sherry said there, I salve is, okay, obviously it's symbolic. Would you agree? It's symbolic. Um, anybody else, any more thoughts? Christine? Well, one, I would show that you actually need something and I, I don't know any earthly eye salve that will unblind you uh -huh. other than when Jesus made the mud and he spit in it and put on the guy's eyes and stuff like that. So it's something that you need and you have to identify that you are blind and then he's going to give you something to help you to see so that dependency is on something that he has for you. See, we, go ahead, Janie. It wouldn't be the word, anointing yourself to read the word. Okay, so here's, uh, I was just, uh, just before you asked that, I was thinking this. Okay, we know that if, if we're spiritually blind, okay, and we come into a service, what is the answer to that blindness in reality spiritually? Him, the Word of God, whatever. So there could be something there just to, all of these three things are all pointing back to Him. Whether it's His Word, whether it's just His presence, I think there's something in here is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Terry, have you thought? And I was just going to say, to me, a lot of it is, is prayer. Because if you're in prayer, it's kind of like you always say, pray when you don't feel like it. and Pray do you do feel like yeah, it. Yeah, and so forth. Because if you don't get something, he says you don't know because you don't ask. Yeah. So if you take it to him in prayer and ask for him to enlighten you so you can, you know, take the scales off your eyes, he's more than willing to do it if you if you humble yourself and ask. What he provides for you will get rid of the scales. So if you think of the, the blindness, what he provides for you, whether it's his word, whether it's his blessing, whether it's just his chastisement, whatever he gives to you, like Ron said, his heart is to bless us. His heart is a heart of love. Whatever he gives to us, there's times we just say, like Job, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray. We've been talking about revival tonight. 
we've actually been looking at the Lord's medicine for revival. And honestly, if we get him, we've got we're in revival. Amen. If we're if we're bound the knee to him, we're in revival. If we're doing our own thing, we are we're we're either lukewarm or we're cold, frigid cold. 